everyone, and welcome to another episode of GenLive. Today, we'll be discussing synthetic biology and the industries that the field will disrupt or is already disrupting, like fashion, food, and medicine. I'm Juliana Lemure, science writer at Gen, and I'll be your host today. I'm joined by three of my colleagues, all GenLive regulars, Alex Philippides, John Sterling, and Kevin Davies. Hi, Alex. Hi, John. Hi, Kevin. Hi, Juliana. And we're also joined today by four very special guests. Aoife Brennan is the CEO of Synlogic, a company that started from an idea of two synthetic biology pioneers, Tim Liu and Jim Collins. The idea was to use engineered bacteria as a platform for therapeutics. The company designs their drugs by engineering biology into an E. coli strain to make synthetic biotics or living medicines. Today, Aoife will tell us more about how synthetic biology is changing the way we think about drug design. Hi, Aoife. Hi, Juliana. Nice to be here. Thanks for the invite. You're welcome. And from spider silk to mushrooms, Bolt Threads is part of a growing industry to change how our clothes are made. David Breschlauer, the company's CEO and co-founder, joins us to talk about how Bolt is creating biomaterials for improved consumer products. Welcome, David. Thank you. Tammy Shu is also working in the clothing industry. Her company, Hue, is tackling a different area of the industry that puts a strain on the environment by creating sustainable dyes for fabrics. Their first project would like to change the process for a piece of clothing that you're likely very familiar with, indigo blue for denim. Hi, Tammy. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining. Lastly, we're joined by John Cumbers, who has been at the center of the synthetic biology field before almost anyone else was talking about it. John is the founder of SynBioBeta, the innovation network for biological engineers investors, innovators, and entrepreneurs in the SymBio field. Not only does SymBio Beta host an annual meeting in the fall, but they also hold podcasts, town halls, and industry tours, and more. So what that means is basically that John can answer any and all questions about the industry. Thanks for coming today, John. Welcome. Thanks for having me, Juliana. You're welcome. We're very excited to focus on SymBio today. The field is in its infancy. In fact, I just saw last week that Twist, a company considered to be a pioneer in this area and also happens to be today's sponsor, just celebrated their eight year anniversary. The field has seen mind boggling growth over the last few years, both in innovation and in financing. At the heart of all of the varied SynBio companies and researchers is a passion for using biology to build a better, more sustainable universe. But what is SymBio? And how does one field have their hand in everything from making clothes and food to medicines? These are the questions that we will delve into today. And we would like to answer your questions too. So please put any questions that you have for our guests into the Q&A section of the Zoom. Now I wanna pass it over to Kevin to tell us about this episode's sponsor. Then he'll kick off the hour by asking John to walk us through some SynBio basics. Kevin, over to you. Thanks very much, Juliana. Um, before we get going with our guests, a uh, quick word from our sponsor. Uh, today's episode of GenLive is sponsored by Twist Bioscience. Twist is a leading and rapidly growing synthetic biology and genomics company that's developed a disruptive DNA synthesis platform to industrialize the engineering of biology. The core of the platform is a proprietary technology that pioneers a new method of manufacturing synthetic DNA by writing DNA on a silicon chip. Twist is leveraging its unique technology to manufacture a broad range of synthetic DNA-based products, including synthetic genes, tools for next-gen sequencing preparation, and antibody libraries for drug discovery and development. TWIST is also pursuing longer-term opportunities in digital data storage in DNA and biologics drug discovery. 
Twist makes products for use across many industries, including healthcare, industrial chemicals, agriculture, and academic research. Thank you very much to Twist for helping get this uh, show off the ground. Um, so John, I, I don't think you can stay for the entire program. So we want to start by inviting you to kind of give us, and particularly people new to the Synbio field, um, a, a quick, uh, but informative understanding of what it, what the fuss is all about. What exactly is Synbio and when would you say, can you give us a brief history of it? When did the field get started? Sure, thank you, Kevin. The field got started more than 20 years ago with a DARPA study on engineering biology. And a lot of the practitioners in that study, uh, Drew Endy was, was one of them. I think Jing Collins at Boston University was, was another one at Boston University at the time, he's now at MIT. We're really trying to look at the field of genetic engineering and saying, how can we turn biology into, a, into a, an engineering industry like we see engineering of computers or civil engineering where we're building bridges or um, software engineering when we're, when we're building software? Because when you 20 years ago, when you thought about genetic engineering, it was, it was taking a tube and putting in some DNA and putting in some restriction enzymes and then plating it out and running, running it out and then chopping it out. I mean, it was like this, this artisanal, uh, you know, I, I cook a lot with my daughter. It was like one of these, one of these cooking, uh, cooking things. Um, and uh, fast forward now 20 years and you've got companies like Twist and you can just, uh, you know, order DNA from Twist. They'll send it to a virtual lab uh, like uh, Stratios is another uh, company in the industry. And, uh, and Stratios will then just integrate it into their system, put it, put it into, the, uh, into, a, into a plate reader, run some experiments and send you back the data. You haven't even had to touch a pipette anymore. So synthetic biology is working. We're turning biology into this engineering discipline. And that's the definition that I'd like your listeners to walk away with, which is that we're trying to make biology an engineering discipline. Got it. Got it. You mentioned Drew Endy, one of the very early pioneers in the field. I'm curious to get your take about the role that Craig Venter played, because I thought Synthetic Genomics, the company he co-founded, seems to me to have been one of the first kind of blockbuster companies. But then it seemed like the field maybe went through a bit of a dip before this latest sort of uh, uh, tidal wave, if you will, of um, scientific development and investor enthusiasm. So uh, what would you say was the influence of, of some of those early companies in, in getting this, this field started? Craig Vent is definitely a force of nature and has done some incredible things at the Venture Institute and at Synthetic Genomics and, uh, and his other companies. So he's had a huge role to play in crafting the public perception and understanding of what's possible and the the synthesis and the booting up of the synthetic genome. Um, I can't remember what, what year that was, probably 10 years ago or more now, mm, yeah. was, was a huge advance. Um, but I think Craig mostly wears his scientist hat, whereas Drew Endy mostly wears his engineer hat. And so if you look at the genesis of the field, it's really a bunch of engineers coming in and saying, how can we make biology easier to engineer? What tools and technologies can we put in place? What platforms? What, uh, what, what concepts around abstraction or standardization can we apply to genetic engineering so that we can have a thousand flowers bloom with lots of people who are engineering things and saying, I'm a, gen I'm a genetic engineer um, rather than a genetic scientist. And briefly, before we bring in our other guests, you started SynBioBeta, I think, almost 10 years ago, maybe around 2012. Um, tell us a little bit about SynBioBeta and what are the biggest changes that you've seen over, over since that time, since the, since the organization got going? Yeah, we started nine years ago in a law firm in, in Menlo Park in Silicon Valley, and 150 people were in that room. David, were you there at the very first one? I know Dan was uh, from Bolt Threads. I was not because I was actually on the material science side at that point. It was before I had uh, partnered with Dan and or early days when I was just meeting with Dan, I hadn't fully got into synthetic biology from the molecular level. I was more material science of biology. So so Emily LaProust, of the CEO of Twist Bioscience, your sponsor, was there. Twist hadn't started yet. Two of the three founders of Zymogen were there. Zymogen hadn't started yet. Ginkgo was there. Bolt was there. Um, and a lot of other companies. So a lot of unicorns have sprung from, from those 150 people and continue to keep springing. We uh, IPO, uh, the IPO for Zymogen is just this week, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, 
and uh, and I was at the right place at the right time. At the time, I was working at NASA, and uh, but I but I I love startups. I love investors. I love technology, and so I just had my ear to the ground. And over the years, just kept listening to this really smart group of entrepreneurs and technologists that called themselves synthetic biolo biologists. And what did they need? And at the time, they needed investment. Now they don't need. They have nobody has any problem uh, with with investment. Um, and then uh, now, now they need uh, advocacy as the industry grows up and, and looks to Washington DC for, for stimulus and things like that. So I'm just constantly with my ear to the ground, listening to smart, clever people do awesome things with biology. And that's how Symbio Beta has evolved. And, and I hope people can come to the annual meeting. We're back in person, which everybody's dying for. It's gonna be the Oakland Marriott in October. And um, yeah, so we've just listened to this awesome industry and, and, and tried to uh, ride on their coattails. And, and I'm very, very proud of uh, all the accomplishments, everything from what Eve is doing at Synlogic to- uh, to So you've what... just made some news, John. So your, your event is gonna be live this year. It is, yes. We're okay. gonna be, uh, bring your vaccine cards. That's, and, uh... <laughs> That's exciting, congratulations. Yeah. We look forward to that. Um, uh, for our audience, please, uh, we want your questions to weave in and out of this uh, program. So use the use the Q and A box, and we'll get to those uh, a little bit later in the program. Um, let me pass over to Alex, who will bring in our other guests. Alex. Uh, sure, uh, Ife. Uh, uh, at uh, Synlogic, I know uh, your company makes therapeutics from bacteria. Can you please guide us through the process that Synlogic uses and explain why Synlogic is considered a Synbio company? Yeah, so, um, you know, great questions, Alex, and a lot of ground there in terms of, you know, uh, directions we could go. Um, I think at its heart, John really captured this kind of essence of synthetic biology, which is applying engineering principles to biology. So co-opting natural processes or functions in order to meet a human need. And at Synlogic, what we do is we take a probiotic bacterium and we engineer specific functionality into that bacterium in order to treat a specific disease state. And we think, think that there's really broad potential for this kind of modality of treating diseases and that we can do things that are not possible with small molecules or other biologic platforms. So we're at this really exciting stage now where we can understand the biology of a disease, Get, kind of tease it apart, really understand what's driving a specific disease process, and then engineer in a function into bacteria that live in and on us to address that specific disease state. So I think there's a, a lot of potential as we start to understand more and more the driving biology behind some of these, you know, really nasty diseases. I think there's potential for synthetic biology to be part of the solution and to help patients and help patients feel better and live better lives. So I think that's what kind of motivates us at Synlogic and keeps us going. I noticed Synlogic's pipeline has a lot, though not all, uh, of treatments for metabolic disorders. Do synthetic uh, biotics necessarily work better there as opposed to other therapeutic areas? So one of the, like all startup companies, you start off with this really broad kind of range and vision of things you can do. Mm -hmm. um, and you have to kind of sieve through that and say, okay, where are we going to build? How are we going to de-risk? How are we going to learn about what this platform can do? And we had lots of things we needed to learn. We needed to work out the regulatory path, you know, start working with regulators and, you know, what, what does this look like? If we're to develop this, you know, FDA, what are you going to ask us to do in order to get this product on shelves in CVS and to patients? We had to worry about manufacturing. How are we going to manufacture these products? So there was a lot of questions. And in order to limit some of the complexity on the biology, on the kind of host side, on the patient side of things, we decided to zone in and focus in on a, a disease area that's where the disease is driven by a specific metabolite. And as Juliana knows from her background in microbiology, one thing that bacteria do very well is consume and produce metabolites, right? So we thought, okay, there's a big unmet need. Often these diseases have pretty well understood biology. So you need, there's like a bad actor metabolite that's causing a toxic effect in a specific disease population. So we know what we need to engineer the bacteria to do which is consume that toxic metabolite. Um, and then often you can really easily measure the products or you can measure the toxin disappearing or the product of the metabolic pathway appearing and having those kind of early biomarkers so that you can determine early in the clinic 
am I heading in the right direction here with this therapeutic is just really beneficial as you're developing products. So our initial programs, you're exactly right, Alex, are all based on treating metabolic diseases, but we're also continuing to invest in the platform and think more broadly about other disease areas like cancer, gut brain, you know, there's lots and lots of science here that can be leveraged. We've just decided to focus on these metabolic diseases initially as we're building the company. Okay, I think, um, you know, I, John, would you like to um, yep. jump in and talk a little bit about um, the clothing industry before? I know John, John Cumbers, I know you've got to go at 2.30, right? Okay, yep. so then we'll have a chance to circle back to you with some food. Exactly, questions. I get one question. Okay. Hey, David, so you're a co-founder of Bolt and you started a little over a decade ago. Um, what was the motivation for starting that company? And why did you focus on re-engineering materials for clothing? You know, it's interesting because I was just giving a presentation internally to the company about the, the, the very history. Um, we, when we were in graduate school and really thinking about um, synthetic biology, very serendipitously, I was working on the material science of spider silk. It just sort of became a fascination of mine. And my co-founders uh, were working on the synthetic, uh, the synthetic biology for the um, production of the polymer. And I thought I hadn't figured out a use for the material I was working with, just how to process this complex protein that seemed to make more interesting structures than any other proteins out there. And they couldn't understand why spider silk as a particular molecule was breaking every one of the synthetic biology tools. Um, we thought we had figured out uh, ways to make the material scalably spider silk as a fine continuous filament that's very strong and so we applied for grants again and i say this we didn't quite know what the market was going to be um but we got our grants at about six months into incorporation of the company and we were talking about what we could do with it it just so happened that uh my co-founder dan's wife worked at old navy so he had she had fabric swatches all around the house and one day he came to us and said look we don't know what product we're going to make with this yet, but at least we can say with 100% certainty that people buy silk for clothing. And I sort of looked at him and I remember distinctly saying, I can't write an army research grant or an army SBIR grant to make silk ties. Lo and behold, the first thing we launched was silk ties. I mean, that's completely, co completely coincidental, but what happened from there was we had just been obsessed with proteins as a whole and materials as a whole. Like there's far more than just fibers. There's rubbers, there's protein nakers, there's like inorganic protein complex. And we're like, oh, we can make all these things. We just have to figure out what to do with them. Now we have a lot of youthful hubris there. I'm not gonna, not gonna deny it. Um, but once we started looking in apparel, it became clear that there were tons of natural materials leather, cotton, silk, linen, all these things that civilization we had grown or scaled because they were both useful and roughly amenable to, to some sort of agricultural or livestock scale or production scale, but were had become detrimental to the environment as we've started producing clothing for billions and billions of people and the way in which we build supply chains. And the only newer technology was all petroleum-based alternatives. Um, so there had to be a way we felt to, to address those issues by using engineering biology to create either the same materials, replacement materials, or newer materials, that higher performance materials, but with a more sustainable and scalable um, basis than either growing cows or even silk is so water consumptive, so incredibly water consumptive. It's one of the most damaging fibers, uh, environmentally damaging fibers, uh, but it's just not used as much. So its total impact is lower. So once we once we sort of looked behind that those curtains, we 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 couldn't really go back. And I gotta say we that made us into more of a apparel materials company than anything else. Um, with the technolo technological core, um, we became very focused on those products and market. 
Well, that's a fascinating background. Julianne? Yeah, thanks, John. Yeah, I can't wait to talk more about what Bolt is doing. And also, Tammy, I mean, I am embarrassed to say I had no idea that the process of my genes being dyed blue was hurting the environment. So I also cannot wait to learn what's going on at Hue as well. But like I said, before we get into that, I just want to um, circle back with John on food for a little bit. So, um, I mean, a lot of people have heard about Impossible and Beyond, um, but there are so many more companies that are working on lab, lab grown meat and fish. Can you tell us a little bit about that interest industry and how they go about making the, the food? Sure. Yeah. I, the industry broadly of um, cellular agriculture is just booming. And if you remember, I, I remember I invested in, in one of these companies uh, 10 years ago, and the, the company's name is Modern Meadow. And Modern Meadow is not a food company anymore. It is a uh, leather company, and they just uh, have a, a product out uh, called Zoa uh, recently, and I'm, um, uh, which, which I'm a, a big fan of. But when, I, when the press release went out 10 years ago for, the, for what they were doing at the time, which was both meat and leather, um, I got uh, an email back from my mom, who's on my mailing list, and, she's, and there was just one word, and it just said, yuck. Um, and, and we all had that, that view 10 years ago of cell-based agriculture is like, yuck, lab-grown burgers, that's disgusting. And then now we have two uh, household names, Impossible and, and Beyond. Um, one of them is, is, uh, is, is proudly a synthetic biology company, the, uh, the Impossible Burger. They've got recombinant heme protein that they use to make the burger bloody. Um, the, other one, the other one is not. Um, and, um, and now you've got, so, 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 so this idea of kind of, uh, dare I say, fake meat is, is, is kind of popular. Um, but still what's not popular is actually using stem cells from, from living mammals and then growing them into, uh, into, into full burgers. And actually we, uh, we always have fun at Symbiobeta with our April Fool's newsletter, which uh, three years ago was, was, was mocking this. We, we came up with a, a, um, a company called Mamudi, which had raised a hundred million dollar series A for the uh, for cell-based mammoth burgers. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we actually got Pat Brown pretty good uh, on, on that one uh, and, and uh, quite a few other people as well. But it's no longer, I, and I was, I was mocking it, but it is no longer a laughing, a laughing matter. There is some serious investors, there are some serious investors behind this, some serious technology. And one of the companies is called BitBio, or, or sorry, Meetable. BitBio and Meetable are, have the same CEO, Mark Cotter. And um, they are looking at the transcription regulation of muscle cells, and they are then mimicking those transcriptional switches to turn on and off the genes that you need to turn on and off to make a muscle cell in a Petri dish. And I don't know the details of the economics. That was why I kind of mocked this at the beginning. Uh, I, I'm kind of with Pat Brown there. It's like the economics just don't make sense. Why would you need to, uh, to do mammalian cell culture um, knowing how difficult it is and how expensive it is? But I'm going to eat my words because there's, there's breakthroughs that have been made in the, in, in the technology that allows you to culture mammalian um, stem cells into, into food. And so that's, uh, that, that's happening as we speak. Like every, every, every couple of months, I'm hearing about new breakthroughs. Now, me personally... I'm I'm a I'm a scientist, and so I, I'm actually vegan now. Uh, over the last year, I've 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 turned vegan. Actually, I've stopped drinking alcohol, stopped drinking coffee. I'm like I I I'm uh, I've I've completely changed my my life based on the understanding that I have on the food that I eat and the impact that it that it has on my on my body. Um, but uh, but so I I don't I don't need uh, cell based agriculture for, for, for a healthy diet. I, I'm happy to eat, uh, you know, we do eat the Impossible Burger regularly. My, my, my wife cooks with it. So uh, I think it's a wonderful, uh, a wonderful future that's being, uh, that's being grown. And, uh, and I do think there's a lot of other people who are put off by being vegan and, 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 uh, and don't want to eat those kinds of food. So if we can, uh, I, I think there's, there's going to be a giant cliff coming in the animal agriculture industry and, and a huge disruption because the margins in this industry are so thin anyway. Um, so I think it's now all but inevitable uh, and it's a very exciting future. Yeah, so that's actually a great point to my next question, which is that people have such a close relationship to what they eat 
And so what do you think the marketing challenges are going to be for this industry and, you know, ensuring that they don't suffer the same problems that the, for example, GMO industry has faced? Yeah, I don't know what the solution is. It's definitely, uh, it is a public perception challenge. I was scrolling through Twitter the other day and I saw an advert for vitamin water and uh, it was, or vitamin water. Um, and it was saying, um, uh, something like contains nutrients was the, was, the, was the thing. And I took a screenshot of it and I, I started to flame on Twitter, like, yeah, and contains 16 grams of sugar or whatever it is that vitamin water contains, which is an absolute disgrace. That's something that's something like glucose, which is clearly correlated with, with nearly every sort of horrible disease. And yet you've got sham companies like vitamin water marketing their thing on Twitter saying that it contains nutrients and that makes it great when clearly it contains another nutrient uh, glucose which is plainly horrible for you so um i'll get off my soapbox shortly juliana but uh you know i i, I don't have the solutions i i think public perception and public understanding of science and um public understanding of what you eat affecting your mental health that's why i stopped drinking and, and eating and drinking uh, alcohol and drinking coffee and started going vegan because uh, i actually have a, a number of um i was wearing a a, a um um an insulin, a, a blood sugar glucose monitor, and I wear this this aura ring as well. So I'm like super in tune now to my brain and what diet does to it, and it's huge. It's like, but particularly the pandemic has allowed me to control for a lot of that. So I hope that consumers wake up, start looking at the data, and uh, and make their decisions based on that. And I think that'll be better for everybody. Alex, did you want to try to get in a question? Yeah, just uh, okay, go ahead. When you brought up John earlier, the uh, investment uh, that the field has seen. And earlier this month, uh, SynBioBeta came out with uh, its Q1 report, had some eye-popping numbers in there, something like $4.6 billion in first quarter investment in SynBio alone, compared to about $905 million in Q1 uh, of a year ago. Now, why do you think investors have warmed up so much to the SynBio startups? Yeah, I think in general, it's the next programmable matter. So it's, it's, and it's Silicon Valley investing in the next big thing and the next exciting thing and paying it forward to the next generation of entrepreneurs. You've got a lot of tech entrepreneurs like the founders of Twitter or, or Google um, or Facebook investing in synthetic biology startups and having venture funds that are backing these things. And then I think the pandemic has just accelerated that even more because we realized that, oh, measurement is important when you want to be able to see whether you might have coronavirus and whether one copy of a gene matters or 10 copies of a gene matters. So you've got you know, tons of companies that are looking at infrastructure and just uh, uh, unseen amounts of money that are going in to be able to track bio, different biomolecules. It, it, it's all about more accuracy. And if you think about the core um, technologies of reading, writing and editing of DNA or designing and building and testing of biological systems, We've done more than that in, in the last 12 months around coronavirus and everybody focusing on the same things. So I think it's just seen a huge boon in investment because of the pandemic. Speaking of the pandemic, your report quotes Ruth uh, Booth, uh, the Atlas Venture uh, partner, is saying that the current financing market uh, was uh, buoyed by the strong sentiment that science will lead the world out of the pandemic. Is SynBio just riding on the coattails of the broader bio industry? Sure. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. definitely it definitely is. It's it's certainly a sense of rebranding around synthetic biology. Uh, I, I liken it to um, I liken it to Web 2.0. If you remember that term after the dot com bust, Web 2.0 came along, and it was I I'm this my startup's Web 2.0. And it's like, well, what is Web 2.0? And there's a lot of people saying it's nothing different. We've been doing it for 20 years, and the Web 2.0 people are saying no, it's different. It's about mm -hmm. user generated content. It's about folksonomy and, and tagging of data, and it's about you know it's it's something different. What I think it really was was a culture of innovation amongst tech entrepreneurs to say we're doing something different. We're rising up from the ashes of the dot com bust, and we're going to create a new industry. And now look at the top companies. Uh, you know, in, in the world uh, and, and how pretty much they are Web 2.0 companies. We don't talk about it anymore. I think the same will happen with synthetic biology, that you've got a new culture of entrepreneurs coming in and saying, I'm not doing things the way they've always been done. I'm not doing things the way Big Pharma does it. I'm doing things the way that 
that, that I think, uh, you know, a tech company would run a biology company. So it's much more of a cultural movement. And that's why I think you've got this cultural difference between broadly biotechnology and, and the, the hip young cool thing, which is synthetic biology right now. But just like Web 2.0, we'll probably stop using the term synthetic biology in, in, in five or 10 years is my guess. But, right, there'll be, but there'll be billions of dollars left on the stock market, just like mm -hmm. there are from Web 2.0. What do we call it then? <laughs> just biology, just life. <laughs> all right, John, we'll let you go. Thanks so much for joining us. Really appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks, everybody. See you all Thank again you. soon. Bye bye. Thanks, John. Cheers. I'll to see you in person in Oakland. <laughs> 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 um, okay, Tammy, like I said, I had no idea that my the process of dyeing my jeans was hurting the environment so much. Can you tell us how big of a problem it is and why it prompted you to start Hue a couple of years ago? Yeah, so I think you're not alone. I think a lot of consumers don't necessarily know um, a lot of the problems with kind of indigo dye and the way that it's used. Um, and so um, when uh, I was uh, kind of first starting in this journey, uh, it was a little bit shocking to kind of learn that um, the process of creating indigo dye is involves a, a really nasty kind of chemical synthesis um, that has um, really toxic intermediates and also is not great for for worker health. And the the process of kind of applying the indigo to the textile also has um, some some pretty um, hazardous processes. Also, um, and so um, when I was kind of back in grad school, uh, um, my kind of main project was looking at how um, natural products are kind of created in, um, in, in plants and other kind of systems, um, which is a uh, kind of much cleaner way of, of producing, uh, producing these molecules. And so my project was um, in making indigo dye. Um, and so we were able to kind of make this process, um, develop this process um, that would be a much more sustainable way of creating this indigo dye um, and uh, that could um, produce the exact same molecule and have the same performance, um, but just be a much better way of producing it. Um, and actually, um, many, I guess, people also don't know that like dyes in general, not just indigo, have this problem of being produced from petroleum and, and also have a lot of kind of hidden backstory to it. Okay, great. Um, Alex, do you want to ask a couple more questions to Tammy and I'm going to... Sure. Uh, jump in and look for some audience questions myself. Sure, thanks, Julia. And uh, uh, Tammy, I'm curious as to how you engineer bacteria to make different pigments. If you could explain some of the biology behind that process. Yeah, so um, the basic kind of principle is that we, there's there's just so much color in the natural world around us. Um, we like to say that nature is kind of the best artist. Um, there's a lot of really interesting natural dyes that are produced by different kinds of bacteria or plants or other organisms. Um, and so we basically kind of look at how these organisms are producing these colors um, and pigments and um, uh, see if we can kind of recreate that in our microbial host um, and, and kind of engineer our, uh, our host with these, um, these different enzymes, um, potentially kind of from different sources to create um, really interesting, really high quality uh, natural dyes. Um, and so uh, though we are kind of focused um, primarily on indigo for now, I think um, we are also looking at this broader range of, of colors out there um, that we could produce uh, in bacteria. Yeah. Now I would think unlike food that consumers don't necessarily care where their denim color comes from. What are sort of the barriers to getting your technology into people's genes? Yeah, I think a lot of it basically kind of comes down to consumer education. I think um, the fashion industry has been hearing a lot from, from consumers, especially lately, um, about um, consumers wanting increased transparency and increased sustainability um, in the clothes that they wear. Um, and um, I think there's a couple of, um, especially in, in, in denim and jeans, there's a couple of um, uh, aspects of, of um, denim that are not sustainable that uh, customers are really advocating for a better solution for such as water usage um, and kind of um, things like that and, and how the cotton is grown. Um, one of the things that I think um, consumers um, don't necessarily know about is, is, is what happens kind of behind, behind the scenes with the indigo dye itself. Uh, and I think that is something that um, as we kind of scale up our process and 
um, kind of prove to the industry that our indigo dye is, is as high performing and as accessible as um, the chemical solution right now. Um, that's something that we um, want to also educate the consumers about, um, that this is a, a better solution. Mm -hmm. How much can Hughes technology apply to other areas of the clothing industry beyond just jeans? Yeah, so um, there's, uh, for indigo, I think indigo is kind of, and denim are, are pretty intertwined and, and most, almost all indigo is used towards making denim and on the, on the other side, denim is basically just, uh, just dyed with indigo. Um, and um, the way we wanna basically expand to other, um, other textiles is that with kind of an increased suite of colors, um, we basically uh, will do a lot of kind of testing to um, see what the best kind of use case and what kind of fibers to apply these denim, uh, these, these natural dyes um, to um, and basically kind of increase um, our, our, our color palette um, for different kinds of uh, uh, textiles and fibers. Very good. So I had uh, just seen uh, on the website that David has been Hughes Industry Advisor. How did your company and David connect and how did you help each other that way? <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, David is one of our trusted advisors. Um, yeah, we uh, when we were starting out, I think um, the kind of journey of Bolt Threads was definitely very inspiring to us. Um, they uh, came ahead of us um, by, by several years and we were um, always very impressed with kind of like their like scientific journey as well as um, the way that they're kind of like um, talking to consumers and and, um, and basically just their entrepreneurial journey. Um, and so uh, I think I had originally um, I met David at a, some, some panel at, at Berkeley um, when I was in grad school. Um, and so then when uh, my co-founder and I were starting, uh, starting Q, we uh, reached out and, um, and got reconnected. Um, it's been definitely a, a big help ever, ever since. Right. Yeah, I'll, I'll add, um, it's, I don't think when we started Bolt Threads, we were not aware that how, I don't even want to say nascent, just how non-existent the industry was. And what I mean by that is particularly in apparel, what we see as consumers is so much advertising about innovation, but the big brands you see and the, the the innovation that's marketed, it's often not very fundamental new materials. It's often sort of supply chain innovation or or treatments or or petroleum based things that were easy to get into the supply chain, but a fundamental new material. The companies hadn't most of these big companies hadn't worked with one in a long time and or had any sense of how to interface with a startup. And the fact that I'm not starting by supplying you with a ton of material, a literal ton uh, to do product development with. And then three years later, you give me a call and say, we wanna buy this in the, in, you know, for you know, $500 million of this, which is how they had been set up with um, the traditional chemicals industry. Cause there just wasn't that much development for new materials and apparel, nothing since Gore-Tex or when polyester became onto the market. So we sat there, you know, iterating with brands and, you know, and to no fault of their own, trying to figure out how to mesh scaling a new material into their product development. We spent all these years doing it only for sort of other, our own advisors to tell us like, oh yeah, like we didn't realize either how we thought we'd be more like a pharma model. They would come in and they'd pay for exclusivity with millions of dollars or something. It wasn't like that at all. They're just like, what do you mean you can't supply us with more than you know 10 grams to start with? <laughs> um, and so that turned out to be a very interesting journey. And talking to Tammy and Michelle when they started, it was fascinating to hear how much more amenable or, or um, educated the brands were when talking to Hugh already um, and how that industry was, how the industry had been built up because I, I get to see it again with fresh eyes from their perspective, because we already have our entrenched established relationships at Bolt. And so it's been very heartening to see, okay, pe people are getting there. We're not fully there. Um, it's not like there's a marketplace of startup materials where this is all very fluid, um, but but the big brands that, that sell the consumer products are getting a much 
a much better handle as to how to interface with biomaterials and bio-based products. Hey, Juliana, before you go to q and I just want to follow up with David on his actual products. So you launched Microsilk Fiber 2017 and Milo followed. followed. Um, how are these materials made and what about them that makes them bolts choices for material alternatives? I'm sorry, what was the second question? What, what about these materials, the micro silk and the myelofiber, makes them very suitable as replacement materials? You know, that's, that's a great question. Um, partially because it, it, you know, it ties into the history of the company. The, when we started with Microsilk, that was more around because that's the technology we knew. And we fundamentally believe that engineering the pro a protein to make a material like a replacement silk is a launching pad for making other, other materials. Um, and in fact, we had talked, we had talked to the full extent of using our silk proteins to make leather. And that was within our plans to make a leather alternative. However, um, what we found over time engaging with the market as we were trying to sell fiber was, you know, per some of the comments John made, the more um, immediate problem that old brands were dealing with was with leather, not with fibers. Um, there's a lot of reasons we could do a whole hour about that. I think fibers are going to become the bigger problem next, um, but leather is the more immediate uh, sustainability challenge. And with the pressure from the food industry, people cutting uh, beef, suddenly that directly ties into pressure on the leather industry because of the livestock concerns. And as much as for consumers, we see pleather and we see quote unquote vegan leather out there, those are not luxury materials. We, they're not often used in luxury products. They don't have the same performance and they're often just petroleum based products. So the, so the apparel industries are going, well, we're stuck between a rock and a hard place. We either use cows or we use oil. Um, so we often say a bolt, no dead dinosaurs, no dead, uh, no dead dinosaurs, no dead cows. Um, <laughs> but uh, the demand, we had continued to develop products and demonstrate scale with our silk. And they kept, people kept saying to us, but do you have a leather product? But do you have a leather offering? We need a leather offering. That's that like, this is great. We can use some micro silk, but we really need a leather offering. Um, and that's what led us down the path of can we find uh, or how do we how do we actually move forward on that leather? And the, the story of we actually ended up not using proteins. We found that there was a much better way because everything we had made to make a leather alternative using our core technology stack didn't make a good product. Um, it just made a film that was not that didn't feel good. And for whatever reason about our personalities, we were very comfortable exploring alternate technologies. And we found something that we felt was way better in mycelium in that, and this goes to sort of the material science side, this is using a filamentous fungus that grows itself into a structure that at a mesoscale, so not like a molecular scale, but actual material, makes very similar structures to what leather looks like. If you take a cross section of leather and look how collagen makes these fibers with the cells into skin, and you take a cross section of a mycelium foam, it's fungal, fungal cells that extend little tentacles, little filaments that look very, it's a very much a sort of a woven like structure. So it was taking, you know, from there it became taking synthetic bi biology from not just what are what are we in, what pathways are we engineering, what molecules are we engineering, but what materials are we engineering, and try to think more from that perspective and discovered that, you know, yeah. we needed we need to to expand our breadth of what engineering biology meant in order to solve solve this problem, and right now leather is. Leather is where the, it's, it's the huge, huge demand is um, in, ter, in consumer apparel um, uh, for replacement materials. Oh, thank you. Juliana? Oh, sure. Well, there's a, um, a great question from Daniel here. He says, I'm really interested in the, Aoife, sorry, I should say this is directed towards you. I'm really interested in the drug development aspect here. Is this a tip of the spear for Symbio? Should Big Pharma be worried? 
<laughs> yes, they should. Um, you know, I think synthetic biology in pharma has uh, potential to disrupt many different areas, right? All the way from drug discovery, manufacturing and scale up to actually using synthetic and engineered cells as the therapy. Um, I, obviously, we're working on, you know, one aspect of that, but the core technology of synthetic biology and the core discipline and there's you know it's like a, um, a a wheel with a hub right and there's certain core technologies that i think can be apl applied across multiple different areas you know the, you for instance there's a great paper recently showing that to speed up antibiotic drug discovery you can actually engineer model organisms so instead of trying to grow tb or whatever difficult organism to screen small molecules you can use a synthetic organism that has the same genetic, same pathways as a way to speed up development of new antibiotics. So I think there's multiple, you know, the core technologies are very, very similar. And then the applications can go in multiple different directions. And I think like everything, I mean, as David was talking about, you know, the consumer and the products and materials, it's the same in terms of interacting with big pharma, because often the core technology to really understand the science and to have that meaningful connection and conversation is only starting to get built internally within those big pharma companies. Um, and you're talking, it's like you're speaking two different languages. You know, in the early days when you start to talk, there's just nobody who has the synthetic biology expertise on the other side of the table to really understand <clears throat> Are you, are you making sense? Is what you're saying valid to engage scientifically? And now we're starting to see that, you know, a lot of big pharma companies now are hiring, you know, postdocs out of Jim Collins's lab or whatever, you know, the, the synthetic biology groups. So I think for sure there's a recognition that there is disruptive potential in what's going on. And, you know, first step is to get that internal expertise within those companies to start to survey, okay, who's doing something cool, who has solutions, some of the problems that we have um, and I think then you can start to see things kind of go from there once they start to get their hands on the technology and see okay how powerful this can be how it can really speed up some of the you know things that took you know a long time to do traditionally um, so I think it's a really interesting time and uh, a lot of potential. Based on that is there pharma uh, can we expect to see with SynBio, what we saw with biotech uh, 20 to 15 years ago, where pharma gets in, starts developing its own biologics, and then over time even acquires some of the companies involved in that field. Yeah, well, you and I know that didn't happen on day one, right? Genentech and Biogen and some of those big companies are still standard. Well, Genentech was acquired by Roche, but Biogen right. is still a standalone company, right? Mm -hmm. Because right. They pioneered in Genentech back in the day, and Genentech was only acquired by Roche relatively late. <laughs> it wasn't, you know, at, at uh, phase one, phase two, they had commercial products when um, that started. So I think, you know, you build a machine around a specific modality, and in order to swallow a new modality requires a lot of internal organizational disruption within these large organizations with their supply chain and, you know, the machines are built. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think we saw with cell therapy, maybe in gene therapy, that happened a little bit earlier than it did with the biologics. Um, so, you know, hopefully companies are realizing that they have to get in at an earlier stage with some of these disruptive new technologies. But if you look at the example of biologics, you know, a lot of the work, a lot of the pioneering work on how to formulate proteins as therapeutics, was done at you know the Genentechs and the Biogens of the world, right? Not not necessarily at the big you know the big players like the Mercks, you know, back in the the 1980s. So um, you know it's hard to know how this will play out. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my sense is that companies are all trying to be more innovative um, and you know are on the lookout for new innovative technologies, and uh, hopefully that will uh, really help the adoption of synthetic biology because ultimately you know i'm excited about the potential to benefit patients right and the more scope and the more mind you bring to the problem and the more you know there's, there's lots of diseases that don't really have great treatments right now right um you know there's still a lot of disease even though we've made a lot of progress i think there's still a lot of unmet needs and diseases where you know either because they're too rare or the biology is too complex or because the business model is not there like antibiotics where you know there's still a lot of human need and I think the more everyone can work together 
and be focused on addressing those needs, I think the better off for all of us, right? So, um, Aoife, can what, I pick up on that? What, what's, what are the diseases that are most prominently featured in your pipeline at the moment or where you hope to go in the next few years? Yeah, so our disease, and I saw there was a question in the chat about more complex diseases like aging. We've actually chosen kind of relatively simple diseases to start off with. Um, so our lead program is in a disease called phenylketonuria. This is an inherited inborn error of metabolism where kids are born without the ability to metabolize a, an amino acid that's in all of our diets. Um, they get really severe neurological issues if it's not caught super early and treated. And turns out these kids have a very tough time sticking with the low protein diet. And we're engineering a strain of bacteria that helps them by consuming the excess fee that they're not able to metabolize. Um, our second program is a similar disease. It's called uh, hyperoxyuria. And, you know, John, as he was talking about his vegan lifestyle, made me think about, well, I wonder what his urinary oxalate levels are like, because it turns out oxalate is in spinach and a lot of, you know, healthy foods, nuts, grains, very high in oxalate. And some people just absorb too much. So if they have a healthy diet, but you're absorbing too much, either because you have a GI problem or for some other reason, you're just taking a lot in. It can't be metabolized by our bodies and it has to be excreted in the urine, which causes really severe kidney uh, issues. Um, turns out bacteria have great pathways to metabolize oxalate, right? So we've co-opted a bacterial pathway, put it into a probiotic chassis to help, hopefully help people who are having uh, too much oxalate and toxicity from too much dietary oxalate. So uh, those are two diseases where we have studies ongoing, but we have multiple other diseases behind in the pipeline that we're working on. Um, and they move quickly. I think that's the nice thing about Symbio is the technology moves quickly. So it's, uh, it's really exciting. Give, given all the uh, progress and investment that we've been hearing and that these exciting, innovative new companies starting up, I, one of the questions that has come in is a little bit um, uh, strikes a, a slightly different note. Uh, uh, Chamar, I think the name is, is a chemical scientist by training, but desperately wants to move into synthetic biology. Um, but he or she says uh, they're struggling to get into a company or join a group um, uh, and, and just struggling to get get their career off to the next the next stage. So for all of you, really, what what what, what do you have any advice and what sort of uh, young talent are you looking actively looking to uh, to bring into your organizations? Yeah, I'll, I'll maybe start off with that and then sure. hand over to Tammy and David. I think it's a great time to consider getting into synthetic biology because it's a young field. So getting in now means you can be, you know, if we're looking for somebody with expertise in synthetic biology, it's we're hiring posts. We're like, you know, we, we want to train people. We're okay bringing people in, you know, after a postdoc because there's no pool of expertise of like, you're looking for somebody with 10 years of industry experience in synthetic biology, it's just not gonna work, right? Cause they aren't out there. If you're doing small molecules, you're looking for a medicinal chemist, lots of people with great industry experience that you can hire, but in synthetic biology, it's such a new area that I think there's tons of opportunities for people to come in and really ride this wave, right? And be the experts in the fields in five, 10 years from now. Um, so it's it's a really exciting time. I think there's tons of opportunity. It's just about getting your foot in the door. David and Tammy, I, I don't know yeah. if you want to add anything from your perspective. Uh, I would definitely agree. Uh, <laughs> I think at you were basically kind of hiring for different levels and I think also um, different kinds of backgrounds um, all across um, microbiology or molecular biology or chemical engineering, chemistry. I think there's a lot of different ways to kind of approach the problems that we're, we're kind of tackling. And so having a diverse background of, of experience is, is really, um, really helpful for us. Yeah, I'd like to I don't jump have in anything more to add than what they said. Okay, good, good, David. Hey, so you're all working in synthetic biology, but coming in a different direction. Are there common scientific challenges that people in this field are still trying to figure out? And the reason I ask is also there's a synthetic biology, synthetic biology coalition formed last week to start a uh, national infrastructure for synthetic biology and also manufacturing, which I know in, 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 in which we cover a lot in gen, uh, bioprocessing, it's a huge part of uh, getting products to market. So are there, are there things people still try? I know it's a broad question, but is there something particular in this field that people are still trying to get their, their arms around? 
Um, I, I'll also, because it directs to one of the questions that was put in here, um, I'll answer from my perspective, um, just so I can also touch on, I'm sort of going through this Q&A trying to, there are a lot of questions. Um, but for us, what we see is, you know, and this is not going to be surprising, one thing is scale up. Um, and figuring out exactly sort of what is the minimal set of things you have to actually engineer um, to and most effective way to engineer to actually get um, uh, to have a cost of cost effective scale. And there's a lot of subsets to that fermentation versus say the biofuels companies that had to solve a lot of fermentation issues. There's far fewer fermentation issues that have to be solved now, but a lot of downstream processing issues. The downstream processing is not um, of, and, and there's a lot of reasons for that. It's not evolved as substantially um, in terms of uh, just becoming more of a, a routine set of processes as, um, as fermentation has. Um, and, and so the industry is going to continue to get there. New tools will be developed. New tools will be available already at scale for other companies to use with all these food tech companies coming into place. We're seeing that, you know, someone asked, is mycelium foam a demonstration of SynBio? And it's interesting debate. Um, that was a question in the thing because we currently use for our foam a natural organism. Now we could engineer it and could engineer new properties into it. However, then we also get into regulatory hurdles. Mm -hmm. um, so there are certain advantages and you see that in the food space as well. If you're making a material out of a whole organism, it becomes a lot more challenged if that organism is engineered. So how do you balance all those factors particularly to then get to scale. Um, and you see very similar things in, in the food space um, for, you know, say mycelium uh, based bacon, you know, you can in the future engineer and make crazy different flavors and this and that. Europe has a whole different regulatory landscape than the United States about genetically uh, modified organisms. Um, that's a lot easier when you're say making a fiber or a dye because that's the product of the organism, not the organism itself. Um, you're not ingesting the organism or wearing the organism. Um, then lastly, I'll say before handing it off um, to our other two panelists, uh, I think we are, we are getting there in the next generations. And I wanna say we, and from my story I've told you so far, Bolt was as much as confused about this as anybody is really understanding where the product market fits are and getting ahead of that before going too deep into the technology or understanding the goals of the technology when getting really, really deep in it. I think, you know, as a lot of these industries start, we have new technology, you develop the heck out of it. And then you go, okay, wait, now, we had all these sci-fi visions, but what do people actually want to pay for? Uh, what, what, where are people going to demand it? And then there's a timing component to that. We were talking about green materials in when we were pitching in 2011, and we were shooed out of offices, and now it's sustainable, 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 sustainable. The word has changed. Everybody loves it. And, you know, we just put our tail between our legs and said, okay, well, I guess no one cares, <laughs> but here we are. The only thing I'll quickly add for people who are listening in there is this interface between machine learning and synthetic biology, I think is a really interesting space because we're still not at the point where we can engineer a cell and predict the potential consequences of that engineering. So there's a lot of iteration involved. Mm -hmm. So being able to get ahead of that and making synthetic biology you know, even more engineerable by being able to predict the knock-on changes that a given um, alteration will, will have, I think is going to be a really hot area. So that interface of, you know, computer science and synthetic biology, I think is a really interesting spot and has potential to solve a lot of our bottlenecks. All right, well, thank you so much. Unfortunately, we have to end this hour. I know that we could all talk about this for much, much longer. But that does bring us to the end of our session. I want to again thank Aoife, David, Tammy, and John for a terrific discussion. And thank you to John, Kevin, Alex, and the rest of the Gen Production team for making this episode run so smoothly. Before we leave, I want to mention that the first installment of a new program from Gen called Close to the Edge will be debuting on May 12th, where Alex and Kevin will be talking to the PacBio CEO, Christian Henry. 
Keep your eyes open for the link to register for this. This is the launch of a new series from Gen Edge, Gen's new premium subscription channel. And don't miss our next Gen Live in May, where we'll be looking at the latest in cell and gene therapy. Thanks again to Twist for sponsoring another episode of Gen Live. And most of all, thanks to all of you for tuning in. I'm Juliana Lemire. Stay safe, and we'll see you next month. Bye, everyone.